Christ died for our trespasses, but was raised for our justification. Thanks be to God. Let us turn our thoughts and minds to worshiping the Lord as we meditatively listen to our prayer room. Grace of the Lord Jesus Christ be with you. And also with you. We come to praise. Could you stand, please? Sorry. <laughs> we come to praise our God and Creator. How can we sing praises in these times? Remember the days of old when God brought salvation. We know that God has saved in the past. Believe that God will once again bring salvation. We, pray. we praise God, God who continues to bring life from death. May we sing, Great is Thy Faithfulness.
prayer for the dead. God, your Son Jesus Christ wore the cross for our salvation and was raised from the dead for the redemption of the world. Give us the courage to take up our cross and follow him, that through his grace we may accept the cross of faithful discipleship and receive the joy of everlasting life with Christ, who lives with you and the Holy Spirit, one God, and now and forever. Amen. Trusting in God's promise of salvation, let us confess our sins before one another and God. Merciful God, we, we confess that we are not sincere We claim to follow Jesus, but have not taken his path of sacrificial love. We, we profess to be disciples, but we are not willing to dare the cross of discipleship. We affirm the virtue of self-denial, but we indulge our selfish desires and seek earthly gain. Forgive us, we pray. Forgive us from sincere repentance through Jesus Christ our Lord. And now let us conclude our prayer together. Forgive my rejection of your will and my contempt for your promise. Heal my divided spirit and reveal your way in my Lord once again. Let selfishness no longer define me. You'll lead to the way of the Lord. Amen. Hear the good news. God, God Jesus, Jesus Christ, 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 Christ,
When Jesus turned and looked at his disciples, he rebuked Peter. Get behind me, Satan, he said. You do not have in mind the concerns of God, but merely human concerns. Our next reading is from Genesis, chapter 17, verses 1 through 7, and 15 and 16. Hear the word of the Lord. When Abram was 99 years old, the Lord appeared to him and said, I am God Almighty. Walk before me faithfully and be blameless. Then I will make my covenant between you, between me and you, and will greatly increase your numbers. Abram fell face down, and God said to him, As for me, this is my covenant with you. You will be the father of many nations. No longer will you be called Abram. Your name will be Abraham, for I have made you a father of many nations. I will make you very faithful. I will make nations of you, and kings will come from you. I will establish my covenant as an everlasting covenant between me and you and your descendants after you for the generations to come, to be your God and the God of your descendants after you. God also said to Abraham, as for Sari, your wife, you are no longer to call her Sari. Her name will be Sarah. I will bless her and will surely give you a son by her. I will bless him so that he will be the mother of nations. Kings of people will come from her. Our epistle reading is from Romans 4, verses 13 through 25. It was not through the law that Abraham and his offspring received the promise that he would be heir of the world, but through the righteousness that comes by faith. For if those who depend on the law are heirs, faith means nothing, and the promise is worthless. Because the law brings wrath, and where there is no law, there is no transgression. Therefore, the promise comes by faith, so that it may be by grace and may be guaranteed to all Abraham's offspring, not only to those who are of the law, but also to those who have the faith of Abraham. He is the father of us all. As it is written, I have made you a father of many nations. He is our father in the sight of God, in which he believed, the God who gives life to the dead and calls into being things that were not. Against all hope, Abraham and hope believed and so became the father of many nations, just as it had been said to him. So shall your offspring be. Without weakening in his faith, he faced the fact that his body was as good as dead since he was about a hundred years old, and that Sarah's womb was also dead. Yet he did not waver through unbelief regarding the promise of God, but was strengthened by his faith and gave glory to God, being fully persuaded that God had power to do what he had promised. This is why it was credited to him as righteousness. The words it was credited to him were written not for him alone, but also for us, to whom God will credit righteousness, for us who believe in him, who raised Jesus our Lord from the dead. He was delivered over to death for our sins and was raised to life for our justification. This is the word of the Lord. Abraham, well, everyone knows him. I doubt that any individual in history is more widely recognized and revered. Abraham is the patriarch to history's three monotheistic religions, Judaism, Christianity, and Islam. In the Bible, of all the incredible people of faith we find there, the only one called the friend of God is Abraham. 
you learn great stories about Abraham from your earliest days in Sunday school. You met him as Abram. The name would be changed to Abraham later. You heard that God called him from his ancestral home, leave your country, your people, and your father's household, and go to the land I will show you. I will make you into a great nation, and I will bless you. I will make your name great, and you will be a blessing. I will bless those who bless you, and whoever curses you, I will curse. And all peoples on earth will be blessed through you. So Abram left as the Lord had told him. Abram pulls up stakes and begins a journey which takes him from one end of the known world to the other. And for no other reason than his God told him to do it. What fabulous faith. You learn that Abram was a generous fellow. When there was a land dispute between his family and the family of his nephew Lot, Abram gave Lot first choice and was content to take the leftovers. You learned that Abram was a compassionate fellow when he learned that God planned to destroy Lot's new hometown, Sodom. Abram interceded on the city's behalf. He actually argued with God in an attempt to save Lot's neighbors, sinful though they might be. But God was not done with him. No doubt you learned that his son Isaac came along miraculously late in Abraham's and Sarah's life. Abraham 100 and Sarah 90. That was in fulfillment of God's promise that Abraham's offspring would be as numerous as the stars in the sky or the sand in the sea. You probably even learned the story in which God calls on Abraham to take his son Isaac to a mountain and offer him as a sacrifice. Faithful Abraham did as he was told. He took Isaac, prepared to sacrifice him, and had the knife poised and ready to strike when God suddenly stopped him. Abraham had passed this, this strange test. The boy was spared. A ram which had been caught in a nearby thicket was sacrificed instead. There are other stories about Abraham in the Bible that probably were not covered in Sunday school. For example, not long into his journey, a famine arose in Canaan. Abram, despite all his vaulted faith, was not so sure now and in danger of starvation. He and his headed for Egypt and hoped for relief. As they came near the border, Abram said to Sari, listen, you are a very, very beautiful woman. If these Egyptians figure we are husband and wife after seeing you and wanting you, they will kill me to get to you. So say you are my sister. Then I will be treated well for your sake, and my life will be spared because of you. So that is what they did. Word came to Pharaoh about this newcomer, and he buys Sari from her so-called brother for his harem. Abram not only is spared, but makes a huge profit, as the scripture says, sheep and cattle, male and female, donkeys, manservants and maidservants, and camels. Pharaoh and his household suddenly began to experience one disaster after another. He traced their onset back to the arrival of Sari, investigated, found out the deception, and confronted Abram. What have you done to me, Pharaoh said? Why didn't you tell me she was your wife? Why did you say she is my sister? So that I took her to be my wife. Now then, here is your wife. Take her and go. So Abram and Sari departed, not only with their lives, but with many possessions, including one slave girl, whom we will hear a great deal about later. Abram is considered very wealthy now, 
But God was not done with Abram yet. He was still a work in progress. The next story you probably did not hear in Sunday school was of Abram as the conquering warrior. It seems that some of the local kings had put together a military alliance to subdue their neighbors. In the process of the skirmish, Abram's nephew Lot was captured. Abram received word about the situation and put together a mini army and rescued Lot. After things settled down, Abram's faith began to waver. And he began to wonder about this guarantee of many descendants, considering the fact at this point he had not even one. God spoke to him in a vision and reaffirmed his promise. God says, bring me a heifer, a goat, and a ram, each three years old, along with a dove and a young pigeon. Abram brought all these things to him, cut them in two, and arranged the halves opposite each other. The birds, however, he did not cut in half. Then buzzards tried to get at the fresh meat, but Abram shooed them off. Finally, Abram fell asleep, and God spoke to him again, promising that his descendants would be given this land. Abram's childless, childless wife, Sarah, not having provided Abram with offspring, <coughs> offers her husband her Egyptian maid, Hagar. So Hagar gets pregnant. You probably remember the rest. Even though Abram has a son and an heir now, there is still a lot of tension in the family because the baby came from the slave girl instead of his wife. God comes to our hero again and says, this is my covenant with you. You will be the father of many made nations. No longer will you be called Abram, which means exalted father. Your name will be Abraham, which means father of many nations. For I have made you a father of many nations. I will make you very fruitful. I will make nations of you, and kings will come from you. I will establish my covenant as an everlasting covenant between me and you, and your descendants after you for the generations to come, to be your God and the God of your descendants after you. As for Sari, your wife, you are no longer to call her Sari. Her name will be Sarah. I will bless her and will surely give you a son by her. I will bless her so that she will be the mother of nations. King of pe kings of people will come from her. By giving two na new names to these two, God is affirming a certain relationship with them. Something similar occurs in marriage when a husband or a wife or both take a new family name. We name our children our pets, other things that are precious to us. In giving names, we are accepting a special relationship for nurture and care. God was saying one more time that I am not done with either Abraham or Sarah yet. But a baby, really, Abraham falls on his face laughing at such a prospect. After all, he's 99. And Sarah is 89. But we know what happens. Isaac was born. Sadly, Abraham allows Ishmael and his mom to get run off by the jealous Sarah. Genesis tells us that Sarah finally dies at the age of 127. Abraham marries again at around 140 years of age <coughs> and has another half a dozen kids. He finally dies at the age of 175, old and full of years. First, I love the story of Abraham because I learned some incredibly important truths from it. First, I learned that God chooses and uses real people, imperfect people. Sell your wife to a pharaoh? Come on, please. 
God was not done with him yet. He was still a work in progress. Second, I see the unconditional nature of God's covenant, the promise of land, descendants, and a blessed heritage never changed from day one back in Haram. It was firm, no matter what. There is no, if you do this, I will do that. No quid pro quo. There is no morals to the story. There was a lot of growth and development that would occur because God was not done with Abraham yet. But the covenant is as secure today as the day it was uttered. This is the nature of our God. Third, I see that people of faith go through their ups and downs. Centuries later, Paul would write to the Romans concerning this man. He did not waver through unbelief regarding the promise of God, but was strengthened in his faith and gave glory to God being fully persuaded that God had power to do what he promised. Perhaps, but Abraham had his moments. How many other times do we read of someone falling on the ground and de decisively laughing at what God has to say? But of course, God wasn't done with him yet. And the truth is, God's not done with us yet. And that is the big lesson I get from this wonderful saga. No matter where Abraham was in his life, God was not done with him. God is still not done with him. Just the fact that we are reading the story, learning from it, being inspired and guard, guarded by it, guided by it, proves that. Abraham and Sarah may have thought they were done. Others may have thought that too but not God, I for one am glad to know that. There are times when life spins wildly out of control. There are other times when life is so routine that even your rut is in a rut. <laughs> and there are times when life is somewhere in between. Well, no matter what your life is like, the good news I have for you this morning is that just as surely as God was not done with Abraham and Sarah, God is not done with you and me either. God can still bring things to birth, to new life through us. I believe that we will continue to experience new vision for ministry and mission, just like the new farm ministry we've taken on. Why? because God's not done with us yet. We are a work in progress. I believe we will continue to see new growth, both spiritual and numerical. I believe that the wonderful sense of excitement that is here in this church will continue to grow. Why? Because God's not done with us yet, for we are a work in progress. To be completely honest with you, God is never done with us. Why? Because of God's unconditional covenant love that we begin to see in Abraham, but come to know in a special way in Jesus Christ. It is a love that will never let us go. Regardless of our failures, regardless of our fumbles, regardless of our falls, regardless of our fears, God is never done with us. No, God is not done with us yet. Hallelujah. In the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. Amen. Let us stand and lift our voices as we sing to him, Give me Jesus. Give me Jesus.
please join me in our affirmation of faith found in your bulletin. This is the good, good news, news which we have, have received, received, in which we stand and by which we are saved, if we hold fast that Christ died for our sins according to the scriptures, that he was buried, and that he was raised on the third day, and that he appeared first to the women, then to Peter, and to the twelve, and then to many faithful witnesses. We believe that Jesus is the Christ, the Son of the living God. Jesus Christ is the first and the last, the beginning and the end. He is our Lord and our God. Amen. You may be seated. During our prayers of the people, when I say, Holy God, would you respond with, hear our prayer? Let us pray. Trusting in God's promise, let us pray for the world and for our needs, saying, Holy God, hear our prayer. God, you bless Abraham and Sarah and promise to make them ancestors of many nations. In Jesus Christ, you have opened your covenant to anyone who lives by faith in you. For all these descendants of Abraham and Sarah, both Jews and Christians, that they may trust in your promise, dwell together in peace, and be a sign of your abiding love. Holy God, hear our prayer. God, Jesus, your son, called the disciples to follow his way of sacrificial love for all pastors and teachers that they lead the church by humble example. Take up their cross in faithful service and live for the sake of the gospel. Holy God, Hear our prayer. God, your reign encompasses all the world, earth. Though many do not remember your gracious sovereignty, for peace among the nations and for integrity with government, that your will be done on earth as in heaven. Holy God, hear our prayer. God, you hear the prayers of the poor, and you satisfy the hunger with good things. For the poor and the oppressed, that they may find deliverance, and for all who voluntarily take up the cross of self-denial to serve the poor and alleviate human misery. Holy God, hear our prayer. God, you know the needs of the afflicted. We ask comfort for those who are suffering and in need of your care. We especially now for healing for the following people. Gail, Aunt Jean, Gail, Mary Inez, Grace, Phil, Anita, Nora Lou, Eric, Michelle, Carter, Bruce and his wife Sally, Leela's friends, Mrs. Campbell, James, and J.R., and Donna Gattrell Dansby, and you hear their cries. And for those who suffer illness of mind or body, that they may find relief from suffering and be restored to holiness. Holy God, hear our prayer. Grant these prayers, Holy God, by your grace, Stir up in us the will to seek out your kingdom with dedication of our lives and ministry to the world. For the sake of Jesus Christ, who taught us to pray by saying, Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who forgive our debtors. And lead us not to temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, and the power, and the glory forever. Amen.
profit us to gain the whole world and forfeit our life? With all humility, let us make our offering to God, trusting not in worldly gain, but in God's sustaining grace.
charge to you today is that you are all disciples of Jesus. Therefore, do not shun the way of the cross, but follow wherever our Lord may lead. And now may the grace of the Lord Jesus Christ, the love of God, and the fellowship of the Holy Spirit be with you now and forevermore. And all God's people said, Amen. Amen.